It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Dozens of business owners from Minden are here at Queen's Park today to continue to push this government to keep their emergency room open. Under this government's leadership, it's set to close the day after tomorrow. It's closing at a time when the seasonal population in the area soars with kids, summer camps, cottagers, and of course tourists. It means thousands of Ontarians will have to travel farther and farther a way just to access emergency services. And this creates a domino effect on the ERs in those communities, putting even more strain on an already strained system. Speaker, will the Premier tell the business owners here today that he will keep their emergency room open? To reply for the government, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I can only imagine how challenging this decision was for the Halberton Highlands Health Services leadership and board. But I want to reassure the people of Minden and that community that I am sure, I am confident that this decision was not taken lightly. Having said that, you know, I want to highlight through my uh, supplementaries the many different programs that are available to community hospitals across Ontario as we work with them as partners to make sure that we have programs and incentives, um, availability to many different accessing programs, including, of course, directing the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, the College of Nurses of Ontario, to quickly expedite those internationally Response. educated graduates who want to train and work in the province of Ontario. And I will share further examples in my supplementary. Thank you. In the supplementary question. You know, Speaker, just to be very clear, the closure of the ER department in Minden is the closure of the hospital there. That's it, right? And it's about responsibility. This government has been in office for five long years, and they continue to skip out on their responsibilities to the people of this province. Today, the Conservatives are turning their backs on Minden families, on cottagers, on kids in summer camps. They're turning their backs on local business owners, some of whom closed up shop today just to be here. The Conservatives are choosing to help private health care companies, some of which are run by this Conservative Party's Order. donors, instead of local job creators who are here today. Speaker, will the Premier take some responsibility and start putting the needs of Ontarians ahead of his profiteering insiders? Please take your seats. Minister of Health. You know, again, I will remind you that hospitals are independent corporations governed by their own board of directors who are duly elected from their communities that they serve. But I want to talk about the programs that are available to the 140 hospital corps that have been using them. And listen, if, if uh, Halliburton Highlands decides to look and explore some of these programs, we are obviously going to work with them as we have with every other hospital. But you know, last year through our efforts and the efforts of Ontario Health, we were able to avert nearly 1,500 emergency room shift closures that were prevented because of the work that we have been working with Ontario Health, with our health care partners and in the ministry. So when we talk about the 911 models of care, where paramedics Response. can take individuals to uh, facilities other than an emergency department, could be a long-term care facility, could be a palliative care facility, dedicated all... Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker, this is the Minister of Health. The buck stops with her. <laughs> Cities like Kingston, Kitchener, Owen Sound, Windsor, Cornwall. It isn't just rural areas who are suffering either. They're all facing alarming shortages of family physicians. And this isn't normal, Speaker, and it shouldn't be normal. And shamefully, this government's misguided actions are only going to make it worse as doctors leave the public system to work at private for-profit clinics. Speaker, to the Premier, will he invest in the public system and get Ontarians the care they deserve instead of selling off their health to the highest bidder? Thank you. 
Minister of Health. Not only will we invest, we are investing, and these programs are available to community hospitals across Ontario. Dedicated offload nursing programs Order. that allow nurses, respiratory technicians, paramedics to be hired so that those paramedics who are bringing individuals into an emergency department can get back out into the road very quickly. There are oh, many programs like that, the emergency department peer-to-peer, -peer, the emergency department locum program, the extern program. We have these programs available, and many hospitals have taken advantage of them. You know, the Premier often says that we will have the backs of our stakeholders, of our partners. We are doing that in the Ministry of Health, and we will continue to do that. And as I said, if Halliburton Highlands decides or wishes to explore any of these programs, we are happy to be a willing partner, as we have with so many hospitals Response. across Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, the Minister has been repeatedly warned about problems with the Eglinton Crosstown Public-Private Partnership. She was warned by the Auditor General. She was warned by the experience with the Ottawa LRT. She was warned by transit experts. These warnings go back years. She had a chance to do something about them. Yesterday, when I asked the minister why she ignored all those warnings, she blamed everybody else. How can the public expect things to get better when the minister refuses to take responsibility for the Eglinton Crosstown P3 fiasco? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I've made it very clear that our government is focused on making sure that the Eglinton Crosstown LRT opens so that it is ready for commuters as soon as possible. But our number one priority is that when it opens, that it is safe for commuters and it is safe for transit operators. Mr. Speaker, that is the number one lesson that we learned from the public inquiry into the Ottawa LRT. Order. I have made my expectations clear to Metrolinx that I expect them to get a, a credible schedule from CTS as soon as possible. But Mr. Speaker, safety is our number one priority and we will not we waver from that, Mr. Speaker. It is essential that the service is safe for everyone to use, but, Mr. Speaker, we are focused on getting it done, and we will. Supplementary question. Let me tell you, Speaker, you don't have to go all the way to Paris to find out how transit, uh, public transit is built. Ontario used to build big things. We used to build them well. Canada's first subway, the Young Line, took just five years to build. The Bloor Line took six. You didn't need complicated P3s Order. overseen by self-serving private consultants and private Order. financiers. It was public infrastructure built by the public sector to serve the public good. Order. And the cost per kilometre of subway adjusted for inflation was barely one-tenth of what it now costs under this government. Why is the minister still defending these costly and risky private contracts instead of restoring public delivery of transit infrastructure? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Well, why does the Leader of Opposition stand in this House as a defender of public transit? When our government puts forward five new subway lines and LRT lines, since we were elected in 2019, the largest transit expansion anywhere in North America, and when the Leader of the Opposition and her party had the chance to support it, Order. they voted against it. Oh, Mr. Speaker, Order. our plan was endorsed by City Council, by York Region, and by the federal government, who, is, who recognizes our plan as so nationally significant that they agreed to fund 40 per cent Order. of the cost of our GTA and Hamilton Transit Plan. Mr. Speaker, the members opposite stand up in this House and claim to be defenders of transit. Yeah. But when it Response. actually comes to voting in favour of it, whether it's for operational support during the pandemic, which they couldn't bring themselves to support, or if it's new lines that are brought forward by this government, Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Thank you. The final supplementary. To be clear, Speaker, we will continue to vote against their terrible legislation and their terrible plans because it is bad for Ontario. It is bad for Ontario. It is ironic 
It is ironic that the Liberal obsession with transit privatization Order. has been embraced and, in fact, expanded by the Conservative government. Metrolinx is now overrun with private consultants. They're embedded as vice presidents. They're managing the Eglinton Crosstown. There are even private consultants managing other private consultants. <laughs> the problem with outsourcing everything to private consultants is that over time, the government loses the ability to do things like build transit. This minister can't even manage her own consultants. While the minister jets off to Paris, people here in Ontario are stuck waiting for transit that will not arrive. Why hasn't the minister been able to deliver the transit that people need? <laughs> Members, will please take your seat. The Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, I cannot believe that the Leader of the Opposition just stood there with pride saying that she will vote again and again yeah. after transit expansion oh, as presented to this House. Mr. Speaker, Toronto City Council endorsed our plan by a vote of 22 to 3. They knew that our plan was the right one for the City of Toronto. Mr. Speaker, York Regional Council voted for our plan overwhelmingly because they knew it was the right one for the York region. But, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition, she knows better. So yeah. she will make sure that she and her caucus consistently vote against the plans Order. we bring forward. And in terms of progress, we are more than halfway through tunneling on the Eglinton Crosstown West extension, halfway through tunneling on Scarborough. We've got shovels in the ground on the Ontario line, and we've announced the RFQ for the Young North Subway extension. Mr. Response? Speaker, our government, under the leadership of our Premier, has made more progress on transit building and transit expansion in this province than ever before. Yeah. <laughs> Members, will please take their seats. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Oh. There are thousands of workers, including over 2,000 CUPE members, working for Peel Region in jobs like long term care, public health, public works, and paramedics. Workers this Premier called heroes during the pandemic. The These workers have crucial knowledge of municipal operations and have earned a seat at the table in any discussions guiding a migration of services to constituent municipalities. Yesterday, we learned that the government is skipping the committee process entirely for Bill 112, so these workers will not have the chance to have their concerns about this bill addressed before it's passed, and the government won't get the benefit of their expertise to improve the bill. Will the minister commit to putting a QP worker representative on the transition board as requested by the Canadian Union of Public Employees, yes or no? To reply, the government has to in question for opposite. Uh, again, what we're seeing from the NDP is they want to contract out their work, of course, to CUPE, and we're not going to do that, Mr. Speaker. It's interesting. We had the opportunity to debate this bill last night, colleagues. Now, I know that my Order. entire caucus was here debating that Order. bill, Mr. Order. Speaker, but ironically, as soon as the legislative dining room closed last night, the <laughs> NDP, they called it a night. Close the place down, put no more speakers up, fast track it, and we're voting on it today, Mr. Speaker. You know why? Because it's the right thing. We're going to start to remove those obstacles that are getting in the way of building homes. And just like the Leader of the Opposition said, they don't want to build, they don't want, it's no, no, no. Try voting yes, 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 and get shovels in the ground for new housing, new transit, transportation. Stop the clock. Order. Restart the clock. The supplementary. Speaker, this project of dissolving a region is a massive undertaking, and people have a lot of valid and important questions. And now, without a committee process, the public won't get the chance to have those questions addressed. In particular, Peel Regional workers and residents of Mississauga, Brampton, and Caledon are concerned about jobs and public services. Now, the minister has promised there will be no service disruptions during the transition, but will the minister commit that there will be no disruption to public services and assure citizens and workers that there will be no privatization or contracting out of public services, yes or no? The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker. I do want to thank the member opposite for the question. 
Look, the region of Peel includes some of the largest and fastest growing communities in Canada, and they're posed for massive and significant growth over this next decade. The region of Peel as a second layer of government uh, that municipalities have having and everyone that wants to build housing has had to have that red tape, that bureaucracy when it comes to getting housing built. As we know, we need desperately to get a million and a half homes built by 2031. And by the dissolution of the region of Peel, this is one great way for us to be able to do that. Now, if this legislation passes, as you know, we are intending to appoint a transition board uh, for the region of Peel, and their advice to the province is going to be on a range of restructuring Bonds. matters, including service delivery, allocation of assets and liabilities, labour relations, long-term financial sustainability, Order. among many others. I ask all members of this House to vote. Next question, the member for Brantford Branch. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Research at Ontario's post-secondary institutions is critical in strengthening the innovation sector and supporting our economy. However, when it comes to innovation, Ontario lags behind other jurisdictions. Unfortunately, this puts our province at a disadvantage in maintaining a competitive edge. Investments in Ontario's post-secondary institutions are urgently needed in order to elevate our status as a global leader in research and innovation. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting research and innovation so that Ontario can compete and thrive in a global economy? Thank, thank you, you, Speaker. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to uh, my colleague for that great question. Yesterday, alongside the Minister of Energy and our PAs, I was pleased to announce our government's critical investment to support the expansion of the McMaster nuclear reactor, the largest research reactor in Canada. Speaker, through an investment of $6.8 million, we are helping McMaster University scale up their nuclear reactor's operations to 24 hours a day, five days a week, to increase the quantity and diversity of isotopes the reactor produces. So what does that mean for Ontario? Speaker, it means more opportunities for expanded research and development in strategic areas like advanced materials, medical isotopes, clean energy, and small modular reactors. And it means countless quality jobs that will support the economy in Southern Ontario, mm -hmm. all while positioning our province as a leader in the global nuclear medicine market and our researchers' reputations across Bonds. the globe. Speaker, unlike the Liberals who oversaw the fruits of millions of dollars of taxpayers-funded research sold off to the highest foreign bidder, our government will continue to foster Ontario-based research and development. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It's such excellent news to hear about the expanded research and production capabilities at the McMaster nuclear reactor. I remember when I had the tour, just the incredible work that they do right there. And it's remarkable and encouraging news that this funding will also lead to an increase in production of medical isotopes that are used to treat cancer. According to the Canadian Cancer Society, over 230,000 Canadians were diagnosed with cancer just last year. For this reason, it is all the more critical that our government continues to make investments that will support and improve Ontario's health care system. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how this investment by our government will impact the health and wellness of people across the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Colleges and Universities, Ken. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member for that question. This investment into the McMaster nuclear reactor is not only beneficial to the economy and research, but it's also critical to life-saving medical technology by producing medical isotopes and an essential part of modern health care. Canadian clinicians rely on access to nearly two dozen different medical isotopes to treat many different types of medical conditions, including heart disease and cancer. That's why this work will have such a wide-ranging impact. It's hard not to have been touched in some way by these conditions. The medical benefits we hope to see will be unparalleled. The reactor will increase medical isotope production by three times what it is now, ensuring that Ontarians will have earlier access to advanced cancer therapies. More importantly, Speaker, it will save lives, and it will take us one step closer to improving health comes, outcomes of those impacted by a cancer diagnosis. It is a strong research that Ontario's post-secondary institutions are conducting that is helping advance Thank you. Next question. The member for Parkdale, Hyde Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 
Yesterday, the many Torontonians who walk, run, cycle, and enjoy Ontario Place every day were stopped in their tracks. Between West Island and Trillium Park, a fence blocking public access has been erected suddenly and with no notice. This isn't the first time something like this has happened. In February, marina tenants were forced out with no notice. Speaker, the Conservative government keeps acting like Ontario Place is a done deal. But the redevelopment plans haven't been approved. The government doesn't even have a permit yet. Why is this Conservative government blocking people's access to the waterfront, a public space? To respond, Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, only the NDP would be offended by a measure that's intended to keep people safe. Now, that fence was installed to protect emergency vehicles. Our government has been very clear that we have awarded a contract for the safe servicing work. It is anticipated to start in the next few very short while. And so it is our obligation to protect the pedestrians that do go to Ontario Place. But Mr. Speaker, we are bringing it back to life. Ontario Place will become a place where it's not just 50 people that enjoy the site, but four to six million people on an annual basis. Order. 365 days of the year. Mr. Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again to the Premier. This government is clo has closed the West Island of Ontario Place to the public even before a building permit has been issued. Like everything else about the government's plans to give $650 million taxpayer dollars to a private for profit luxury spa that's on public parkland, the timeline of this entire Order. project is suspect. In September 2018, Therma hired Conservative lobbyists. Two months later, the government announced their plan to redevelop Ontario Place. In May 2019, the government requested proposals to redevelop Ontario Place. Simultaneously, they changed regulations to exempt projects like Thermas from an environmental assessment. As the timeline suggests, did Therma have an inside track before the government even considered privatizing Ontario Place? Question. To reply, once again, Minister Thank of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. What they fail to recognize, Mr. Speaker, is that if we don't do the site servicing work and the shoreline enhancements, there won't be an island to enjoy years from now, Mr. Speaker. There are erosion and flooding issues. But that being said, Mr. Speaker, we have three wonderful tenants that are investing hundreds Order. of millions of dollars to bring the site back Order. to life so that four to six million people come there to enjoy with their families. 2,500 permanent jobs will be created, and in greater, with greater coordination with Exhibition Place and the City of Toronto, this will be a hot spot for people to go. Mr. Speaker, Speaker, I cannot believe that the members opposite are literally raising this issue today. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. I'm having difficulty hearing members on both sides of the House who have the floor because of the level of noise on both sides of the House. I will start calling out members by name if this continues, by writing name if this continues. Thank you. Start the clock. The member for Peterborough Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday I had a question for Minister Smith. Today I have a question for another Minister Smith. Speaker, there's almost as many Smiths as there are Liberals here. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. The forestry sector is, a critical, is critical to Ontario's economic strength and to the communities it supports throughout the province. This sector alone provides more than 149,000 jobs and helps to generate billions in revenue for our province. Unfortunately, the previous Liberal government all but ignored the valuable contribution of the forest sector, much to the detriment of rural, remote and northern Ontario communities. That's, right. That's why our government must act Order. now to create the conditions where forest businesses in the north can operate efficiently and be competitive in the global market. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to strengthen the forest sector? Uh, that's a good question. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Peterborough, Kawartha, a.k.a. God's Country, a.k.a. Go Peets, for the question. 
Mr. Speaker, as you know, our government is committed to taking meaningful action to support our commitments to support the forest sector, its workers, the communities that depend on it. You know, no government in the history of this province has done more to attract investment, drive innovation, and create good jobs. It doesn't stop, Mr. Speaker. That's why the Ontario government is creating the new forest biomass program. This program will provide an investment of $19.6 million in funding to projects that will expand wood harvest from Crown Forest. Here, here. Biomass includes mill byproducts for manufacturing, bark, shaving, sawdust, as well as trees and above-ground parts that aren't suited to the production of other forest products. And Response. one of those regions that will benefit in Northwest Ontario uh, is the beautiful region of uh, Atacoke, and I was pleased to make that announcement. Thank you. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A previous Liberal member actually referred to the North as no man's land, but we know that Ontario's world-class forest industry plays a key role in our government's vision to build Ontario, creating good-paying jobs, boosting economic growth, and supporting communities across all of our province. With an abundant supply of forest biomass products in Ontario, that's why it's so vital that we support this emerging industry and its innovators. With so many possibilities, it's essential that our government explore all options to create opportunities to address the untapped economic growth in northern communities. Yep. Speaker, can the minister please expand on how the forest biomass program will drive innovation in the forest industry? That's a good question. Resources and forest. Thanks, Speaker. With byproducts from one industry segment feeding the demand from another, we can build and expand new industries, an industry generating less waste where no opportunity goes unrealized. And this program will support projects to harvest more wood from Crown Forests, increase forest sector job creation, increase regional economic growth, and find new uses for wood in collaboration with business, industry, and Indigenous communities. In short, Ontario will be a leader in innovative uses of forest biomass. Early this summer, the program will be open to applications for businesses, municipalities, Indigenous communities and not-for-profit organizations located in Ontario that have a project to expand the use of forest biomass and enhance the forest biomass supply chain. Speaker, Ontario's forestry sector Bonds. is prime for growth, good jobs and innovation. We're building a forestry sector unlike anything this province has ever seen. Yep. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Yesterday at the York Catholic District School Board, they voted 6-4 to four to not fly the rainbow flag. This was based on a recommendation that came directly from their committee, the Gender, Sexuality and Catholic Education Committee. That committee recommended that they do fly the flag, saying that it would be consistent with the pastoral mission of the Catholic Church. Now, we know that suicide is the leading cause of death for young people, and that, multi that number is multiplied many times for the 2SLGBT community. We've seen the anti-2SLGBT hate uh, statistics rise in Ontario by 64 per cent, and yet this government remains silent. We need to know when will the minister say something, make a statement, and what will you intend to do to keep students safe? I remind the members to make your comments through the chair. Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we uh, have been clear and consistent since this issue first arose. Our message to children in our schools, particularly from the LGBTQ+, is that we see them, we value them, and we are proud as a government to stand with them now more than ever. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we have been consistent on this issue, making clear our position that pride is something that we can rally behind as a parliament that every child in a publicly funded school should be supported, should feel affirmed, and should feel safe. I do agree. And that's been our position in the province since the issue arose, and we'll continue to make that case. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue as a government to actively participate in pride, what it represents, universal love for every child in this province. Thank you, Speaker. The minister is more than happy to dictate rules and practices to school boards when it involves funding that he's not providing, like on mental health and reading and math. That's what Bill 98 is all about. But suddenly, here's something that the minister could do that would actually protect kids that doesn't require any resources, and suddenly he's powerless to act. Why doesn't the minister just simply direct all schools in Ontario to fly, to fly the pride flag? Minister of Education. 
Mr. Speaker, we have been clear and consistent in our expectations and our hope. We believe the Pride flag is something we can rally behind. It represents a welcome, inclusive message for every child. We know that those kids face disproportionate impacts and challenges in schools, which is why the government, the Premier and our entire party will continue to be at Pride, visibly, actively celebrating with the LGBTQ community. Order. We'll continue to stand with those kids. We'll continue to encourage school boards to do their part to make sure every child in Ontario feels safe, affirmed and respected. Next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, I visited Minden and joined the rally with residents who are fighting to save their ER. Here's what I heard. People are losing faith in this province's health care system, and they're worried. They're scared for their community and angry that they're being left behind. In less than 48 hours, residents will be at least 20 minutes further from emergency care. Closing an ER is more than just inconvenience. It can be the difference between life and death. The people of Minden, Halliburton and Kawartha Lakes are about to experience the very real consequences of this government's Bill 124 and other irresponsible decisions regarding our health care system. My question to the Premier. Minden Hospital is publicly funded. Instead of simply letting Halliburton Health Services take the heat for this decision, will this Conservative government take accountability and admit what Minden and the rest of us know, that the Minden ER is closing under their watch? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Well, again, I will remind the member opposite that while this decision, I'm sure, was very challenging for Halliburton Highlands leadership, uh, it was a local decision based on consolidating those two emergency departments to make sure that the services were Order. provided. And, you know, I, I have to talk about the investments that we are doing in the province of Ontario in health care. Uh, from the beginning, we've talked about short-term, long-term, medium-term goals that get us to a place where we have sufficient health human resources. And frankly, Speaker, this is not just a health issue. We have a minister of re, uh, college and universities. We have a minister of labor who have worked very, very hard to ensure that we have sufficient capacity within our system, whether it is is training young people in our schools with trades, whether it is uh, new residency spots that are available now in the province of Ontario that, frankly, under the Liberal and the NDP governments previously, were cutting residencies. Order. The supplementary question, member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. The people in Minden, some of whom are here today, Halliburton and Kawartha Lakes, are being left behind by their MPP and this government. Did the Minister of Health even ask HHS why they're doing this? There has been no community consultation. They have not talked with doctors nor hospital staff, and the government has offered no justification for putting the people of this large geographical area at risk. The HHS plan for the Halliburton Hospital, which will have to serve the 13,000 people who use Minden's ER, is not ready. Doctors and nurses' shifts for the busy summer season just a few short weeks away have not been filled. The Minden Hospital has their shifts filled all the way to September and did not close once last summer. Once. Yesterday, in response to a question from a Don Valley East colleague, the Minister of Health offered up Bill 60. My question to the Minister of Health. Why is she not Question. demanding answers from HHS and intervening in their decision to close the Minden ER? Yeah. Mr. Bell. You know, uh, the Liberal member opposite will assign blame to the local hospital leadership. We are providing assistance, and we are doing that through expansions Order. of residency fees, which I will again remind the NDP government, the Liberal government, both cut residency positions in the province of Ontario. It is our government for that Ottawa has South come to order. It is our government that directed the College of Physicians and Surgeons and the College of Nurses of Ontario to quickly expedite, assess, and ultimately approve and license um, internationally educated graduates for Brampton who North to come to order. in the province of Ontario. Bill 60 has an as of right first in Canada that allows clinicians who have a license in other Canadian jurisdictions to come immediately to Ontario and practice. Here, here. We're doing the work. You're assigning Spons. blame. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Okay. Not sure if you heard. The member for Brampton North come to order. The member for Ottawa South come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Cambridge. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. Throughout Ontario, individuals and families are encountering challenges relating to housing availability and affordability. Mm. Recently, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing announced additional funding by our government that will help to support community housing providers across the province. This funding has the potential to make meaningful impact by providing much needed housing for vulnerable individuals and families in my local community of Cambridge and the region of Waterloo. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please provide further details on how our government is helping to increase the availability of affordable housing options for those the most in need? Great question. The Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you, Speaker. And I do want to thank the great member for asking that very, very important question. Speaker, our government recognizes the urgent need for affordable housing right across our province. And that's why last week, together with the federal government, we announced a joint investment of over $46 million to support the creation of 267 new affordable housing units across Ontario. Through the Canada-Ontario Community Housing Initiative, funding will be used for new construction, repairs and maintenance to sustain and expand community housing options. For example, Speaker, Indwell St. Peter's Supportive Housing Project in Kitchener will receive $5.5 million to develop 41 affordable and supportive apartments for those on the region's housing waitlist. Response. This investment demonstrates our government's commitment to tackling the housing supply crisis and improving the lives of vulnerable Ontarians. Thank you. A supplementary question. Every person in Ontario deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. Our government's continued investments in affordable housing projects truly demonstrates our firm commitment to addressing the housing supply and affordability crisis. This recent announcement is just one example of how our government is developing partnerships and innovation solutions when it comes to important issues related to housing affordability. However, we know that more action is needed now and that housing availability and affordability must remain a priority for our, our government. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please expand on how this additional funding will help support housing providers in addressing the needs of vulnerable individuals and families? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and once again, thank you to the great member from Cambridge for the question. And as the member notes, increasing our housing supply requires partnerships and innovative solutions. Our government is collaborating closely with the federal government through initiatives like the Canada-Ontario Community Housing Initiative to repair, regenerate and expand community housing so tenants can live in a home that is affordable. The $46 million announced can also be used to support community housing providers whose original program arrangements are expiring and help them to become more sustainable. We also consulted with local housing providers and municipalities to understand where support is most urgently needed and strategically targeted groups like those Indwell will serve through tailored supports and unit design. Speaker, I'm confident Spons. that these 267 units will make a very big difference for those who need an affordable place to live close to home, because when community thrives, Ontario thrives. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Energy. The City of Toronto has passed a resolution calling for its growing electricity needs to be made or met through efficiency and conservation. It has formally rejected the ramping up of gas-fired power in this city. Credible studies show that we can deliver Ontario's energy needs through efficiency and conservation at a much lower price than gas-fired power. That's what Toronto wants. The minister has the power to reject the proposal to ramp up gas burning at the Portland's Energy Centre, which will increase air pollution and accelerate the climate crisis, as well as drive up the cost of electricity. Will the minister protect the public from higher electricity prices, from more air pollution, and from the climate crisis by rejecting this gas-fired proposal for ramping up burning in the city? And to reply, the parliamentary assistant and mem member for Kitchener South Hester. Thank you, Speaker. Um, every day in the uh, in the paper.
paper, we see more excellent news about the jobs that are coming to Ontario, the manufacturing that is coming to Ontario. This province was a ghost town uh, when it comes to jobs, when it comes to manufacturing, and it's alive again. It's alive largely because of our work on the energy file. We directed the uh, OEB to procure 4,000 megawatts of new generation, including 1,500 megawatts of natural gas. Member opposite talks about driving up uh, electricity prices for consumers. Um, when uh, asked about phasing out natural gas by 2030, the uh, estimation was to add approximately $100 to the average consumer's electricity bill, um, making cost of living uh, unbearable for Ontarians and also driving business out of this province. And frankly, that is not something that is ever going to be acceptable to this government. Here, here. We foster jobs, we foster innovation, Response. we foster energy. Here, here. Members, will please take their seats. Restart the clock. Supplementary question. Member for Toronto Dan. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy. This is a really simple question, right? <laughs> like energy efficiency and conservation are cheaper than burning gas, right? That's right. They put people to work, they reduce the cost of electricity, less air pollution, less pressure on the climate. It's really cost effective to do this. The ISO says it's cost effective to do it. The ISO says it's reliable to invest in efficiency and conservation. The city has rejected the gas burning approach. Your ministry has said we will respect municipalities. You have the power to reject this, to take a course of action that's less expensive and better for the environment. Will you do so? Yes, no. Dan, I'll remind the members to make a comments through the chair. Member for Kitchener South Hesper. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, again, I do, of course, find it ironic to hear the words about expensive coming from the opposition when we have a, a member in the party that so actively supports an increased carbon tax. I think the issue is here is the, uh, the opposition uh, continuing to uh, fail to understand the complex interplay when it comes to uh, a greener Order. planet and greener energy. Um, we are producing green, Order. clean green steel here in Ontario uh, to keep our manufacturing and our industry on board. What the opposition does is that these products will come from elsewhere, and they're our monitorship. These products come from Ontario, made to the highest environmental standards possible. Understanding a greener Order. economy is looking at the whole picture, not just one ideological, unfounded perspective. Good job. Order. The next question. The member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. My office has been overrun with emails from farmers from across Ontario who are very concerned with Bill 97 and the provincial planning statement. Speaker, members opposite must be getting the same message because yesterday in this House, the Premier seemed to be backing down. I guess the question remains, how do we go from zero severances to three severances per farm? This government's preoccupation with building houses is clouding judgment, as this proposed policy puts over 510,000 acres of Ontario farmland in jeopardy. And in Oxford County, they've concluded in a recent report that 10 per cent of its prime agricultural land could be lost forever. Farmers don't want to hear how important it is to build these houses. They see the value in one succession planning lot, but three. Speaker, through you to the minister, what Question. was the significance of the three lots to begin with, and how will this government proceed on this policy? Mr. Of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise in this House today to share that the purpose of moving Ontario forward is that we're excelling on all cylinders, and that includes our agri-food sector. And it means making sure that we have employees and family members that want to work on the farm close to home so they have access to that farm. But the most important part in all of this conversation today is to recognize that our government put forward a consultation on the provincial policy statement. The whole concept behind a consultation is that you position, you, you put out ideas so that you can hear people's perspectives and bring them back and understand where priorities lie. Order. And in that spirit, I am so pleased to share with you, as the Premier for shared Hamilton yesterday, come to order. that the Response. commodity organizations, the livestock commodity organizations and other organizations as well, came forward, exercised their respectful voice. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. 
while I appreciate the answer, consultation after the fact is really a moot point. This, in this winter, I in introduced my first private member's bill, a bill designed to protect Ontario's most productive lands, a bill supported by Ontario's top farm groups and everyone in this House except those purporting to be pro-farmer. Before I introduced my bill, I met with farmers, I met with farm organizations, and I solicited their opinion ahead of time. The fa past few days, we hear this government backing down on the original proposal, but where will we land? A government in touch with rural Ontario would have known this was not a good idea to float in the first place. So with all due respect, farmers and the people of Ontario don't need more time. They don't need until August 6 to tell this government how they feel about this policy. Speaker, through you to the Minister, will this government announce today that their trial balloon has been popped, and will they back down on this policy? To respond, order, order, order. To reply, the Premier. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the member for the question. You know, we we came out all in good intentions, talking to farmers, as I mentioned yesterday. The number one, the number one concern is the kids are leaving the farm, they have no place to leave, uh, live. And there's many jurisdictions that won't even allow the farming families to build a home for their kids. And then the other big concern, and I mentioned it yesterday in the House, I talked to a farmer yesterday and he has 100 temporary foreign workers that they have no place to, to live. So we're listening to the farmers, and as I mentioned yesterday, again, we sat down with the farmers, all the associations, and they thanked us. They thanked us for always having their back. They said that there's never been a government, never been a government Order. that supported the farmers more than Response. they did. We're going to listen to the farmers, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Scarborough Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. All seniors in Ontario deserve to be treated with dignity and to receive the quality of care that they need and deserve. Under the previous Liberal government, Bingo. many issues Bingo. in long-term care infrastructure were not properly addressed. After the people of Ontario elected Ontario government in 2018, there have been a renewed focus on addressing our health care infrastructure. While we have seen many improvement, there is still a need to increase the capacity in our long-term care homes. Our government must continue to expand on the critical investment made be because of Premier's leadership. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister please Question. provide an update on our government plans to build a long-term care infrastructure in our province. To reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much to the member and Mr. Speaker. The government is cur currently making an unprecedented amount of investment in long-term care facilities across the province. Last Thursday, I was joined, or I joined the Premier and the Minister of Long-Term Care to open the doors of a new long-term care home in Toronto. Humber Meadows will bring 320 new beds to the residents of Toronto and um, has opened next to Humber River Hospital. Mr. Speaker, the location of the home itself is so critically important because, Mr. Speaker, this long-term care home now will be integrated into the broader health care system in the province of Ontario, and it will allow the long-term care home to have additional services within the home, such as di dialysis, to make sure that the seniors are taken care of and have the best service possible. Supplementary question. It is extremely important that Ontario continues to build up our critical infrastructure to address our, our province's need. The previous Liberal government failed to plan ahead for the needs of seniors in our province. Former Premier Kathleen Wynne even admitted that her Liberal government did not do enough when it came to improving long-term care Order. infrastructure in our province. That is why it is so critical for our government to make critical investment now to ensure we are meeting the infrastructure need for our province's future. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, 
Can the minister please explain how our government is building more long-term care infrastructure faster for people of our province? Stop the clock. Okay. The government house leader and the member for Ottawa South want to have a conversation. It would be appreciated if they take it out into the hallway. Order. Start the clock. The response, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much. To the member and Mr. Speaker, the, this long-term care home was part of Ontario's Accelerated Build pilot program, which was part of our government's $6.4 billion commitment to build 30,000 new beds and, of course, upgrade 28,000 long-term care beds in the province of Ontario. Now, the whole concept of the Accelerated Build program was to leverage hospital-owned land, which is always a challenge in urban settings, to use provincial tools and resources in order to make sure that we can get the approvals necessary and use accelerated construction techniques. Mr. Speaker, we built a long-term care home in 13 months in Ajax. We built a long-term care home in Toronto. Uh, Humber Meadows. Within 28 months, we have two more long-term care homes, which are, will open very, very soon. But the most important point of this is, Mr. Speaker, we can't take eight years to build a long-term care home in the province of Ontario. We need to do better. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Maria, her husband, and, her, and their four-year-old daughter have been living at the Christie Refugee Centre, a shelter, since February. The family found a rental home, applied for funding to help cover the cost of rent, and were getting ready to move in when they were told that funding to this rent supplement program had been cut by the Conservative government and the program is no longer available to them. Premier. What is your plan to help families like Maria's move out of the shelter system into rental homes so they could build their lives here in Canada? To respond, Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Part of our plan has been right from the beginning, right? Part of the plan was we understood how important it was to build houses across the province of Ontario, but not just single family detached homes. Uh, we wanted to ensure that we had more purpose built rentals because we were hearing stories like this on and on and on and on again. Now, what, one of the things that the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has raised is how important it was that the federal government continue to contribute to the province of Ontario, but that they actually equalize that support. As you know, Mr. Speaker, they have reduced our funding. By I think it's about $500 million when it comes to the uh, housing support program in the province of Ontario. So I would ask the member opposite. She could actually, the, the opposition could do us a favour. The NDP, of course, hold the balance of power in Ottawa like they did here. If the NDP in Ottawa could do us a favour, if they could ask Jagmeet Singh to inquire with the federal government if he will equalize and Response. send us that cheque for $500 million, that is so important to the people of the province of Ontario so that we can continue to provide this valuable support. Back to the member for the University of Rosedale, supplement. I'm asking what this government is going to be doing to helping people in Ontario. The Canada-Ontario Housing Benefit helps people in shelters find permanent homes by helping cover the cost of rent. And this year, the Conservatives cut funding to this program by 23 per cent, at a time when the demand for shelter services has never been higher because the shelter system is at capacity. The city is asking for $20 million in funding from the Ontario Conservative government to help shelter residents move into permanent rental homes so they can rebuild their lives. Can this government say yes to the City of Toronto's request? The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I do want to thank the member for the question. Our community housing renewal strategy is providing over $4.5 Four billion billion in funding dedicated to sustaining, repairing and growing community housing and addressing homelessness. And as part of this, $1.2 billion through the Social Services Relief Fund is to improve housing and homeless shelter solutions as well as supporting vulnerable people. And in January of 2022, we launched the Streamline Development Approval Fund that makes more than $45 million available to Ontario's 39 largest municipalities, including Toronto, to help them implement these initiatives. 
This is a government that's been providing, will continue to provide, more than $936 million in much-needed funds to municipal service managers and Indigenous program administrators Response. in 2023-24 and 2024-25. Through many of these initiatives, it's this government that's getting it done. We Thank you. The next question, the member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Solicitor General. Our frontline police, fire, and EMS professionals across Ontario are regularly exposed to traumatic events while responding to ever increasingly complex and dangerous situations. This workplace stress and trauma takes an immeasurable toll on the physical and mental health of our dedicated frontline members. In the past, many attempted to cope with this trauma on their own and without professional help. Our first responders deserve to have access to the care and supports that they need when they need it. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain what actions our government's taking to support the health and wellness of all frontline first responders? Here, here. The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my great friend from Chatham, Kent Leamington, for his question. And I'd again like to welcome the fire chiefs from Ontario who are with us here today. Our heroes on the front line deserve nothing less than our respect and support, and our government will always do everything we can to support and to protect all those who need our help. We care about their safety and their security, and that's why our government is investing over $45 million over the next three years in programs that will focus on early intervention and provide access to specialized mental and health services. Monsieur le Président, je suis fier. Speaker, I'm proud to support our firefighters and our police officers and everybody who secures our security every day in Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. It's so encouraging that our government is making real investments into mental health supports for our first responders. The situations encountered by our frontline officers are always unpredictable and often threatening. The need for specialized services and resources is urgent and needed now more than ever. <laughs> Family members are also affected by the demands and occupational risks experienced by their loved ones to work as first responders. The mental health of families can also be impacted, particularly when the life of a first responder ends suddenly and tragically. Speaker, can our Solicitor General please explain how our government plans to expand support for first responders and their families? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my friend for the question. I really appreciate it. And I agree with the member. It's important that our government continues to support our frontline officers, our first responders, our firefighters, and their families every day. I'm pleased that we've announced an additional $9.6 million investment to support Runnymede Healthcare. And under the leadership of Premier Ford, we are moving forward with the construction of the Runnymede First Responders Post Traumatic Stress Injury Rehabilitation Centre in Caledon. And we're proud of it because this is a first of its kind world class facility, a place of respite. This will be a place of healing that is long overdue. Our government is committed to seeing this dream be a reality in the coming years, and we are determined to make this happen. Mr. Speaker, a safe Ontario Response. is a strong Ontario. The next question, the member for Mesquite, Merci, le Thank you, Speaker. Here, I agree with you, but that includes First Nations. <laughs> Premier. Who can forget the tragic fire incident that took the life of a 10-year-old girl in Piwanek, as well as others in Kuitnuk? These communities have been waiting years for appropriate fire suppression equipment to combat fires. What did we learn from this? I received a call last week from Fort Albany because they don't have a functional fire truck. They are currently can't suppress fires, only evacuate people and let the fire die out. We must equip communities up north. Premier, what will your government do to get a new fire truck in Fort Albany and ensure all First Nations have proper, proper firefighting equipment to avoid another tragedy? The Solicitor General. Well, Mr. Speaker, we stand with all, all communities across Ontario. We had 
We had terrible tragedies in Pekanjikum, as a, me a member knows, earlier this year. And I would spoken to Chief Shirley Keeper many times. This is of particular importance to us, and we're going to continue to work cooperatively with the federal government, as the member knows we have to, at the community level, to ensure that there is no red tape in responding to fires. Mr. Speaker, this is a multi-jurisdictional issue. Ontario will not stand by. And just as we were working with dispatch to help the community Communities of Pekanjikum, we will always be, be there for everyone in Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the response. However, this doesn't provide any relief. We need action. Our communities need actions, and we need it now. Do we need another tragedy to react? I request now to do your job and to give the First Nations what they need. Then the arrest of Canadians, and that's acceptable? I don't think so. The situation is urgent, is an urgent one. We simply cannot wait for another life to be lost. Je vous demande au gouvernement. I ask the government to do what you need to do. We're dying because we don't have the proper equipment for fire suppression. So, Premier, will this, the government act now and ensure communities are equipped with proper fire fighting equipment in First Nation community up north on the James Bay coast? Would they need help? They need the equipment, and the government needs to act now. Members will please take their seats. General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, comme je l'ai déjà dit, and I said this before. As I've said it before. We're not doing nothing. We're treating the safety of all Ontarians with great importance. After the terrible incident in Pekanjikum, the Ontario Fire Marshal was immediately dispatched there. He brought smoke detectors, he brought fire extinguishers, he brought other important equipment that is, was required then. This is something that we take Order. seriously. And the member knows, and the member knows this is a multi-jurisdictional issue. I will do whatever we can. Our government will do whatever we can Order. to intercede with the federal government, and we will do the right thing. We will always represent and everyone in Ontario to keep Ontario safe. That concludes our question period for this morning. Two members have informed me they have points of order to raise. I recognize first the member for Ottawa South. Hey, thank you uh, very much, Speaker. And I just want to say it's so good to see so many red ties in this legislature again. And I want to let my colleagues across the way know, OntarioLiberal.ca, it's free to join, and you know where to find me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Point of order. The member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you know, many are wearing maroon ties today. In support of Ontario's representative at the Memorial Cup, I invite everyone to come down to the uh, main uh, staircase after question period to have our picture taken. And I do have extra ties if any of the independents to my left, because they are a party that cannot be named would like to join us. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. We now have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading.